Welcome back to the Underworld Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Danny Gold, and today I am here with the man in Trinidad, Mark Bassant. He's an investigative journalist, one of the best in the region. You know, he's the kind of guy who has done such amazing work. He's had to flee uh, the island for for a couple months to, you know, in fear for threats to his life that he was getting. Um, he's covered all sorts of stuff. I mean, he's broken stuff on on FIFA corruption on isis activity in trinidad which was a big thing which if you don't know about we get into here you know he was the guy who put together my trinidad doc that is still i think the most watched documentary i've ever done he knows all the players the gangsters the the big time police officers military politicians all that he's broken all sorts of corruption stories you know across across the region and he's just a, a great guy you know he was the guy who when Anthony Bourdain went down to Trinidad, he's the one who showed Bourdain around. Of course, you know, Bourdain went after me, but that's another story. Anyway, please enjoy this interview. Some great stuff here. And uh, this is Mark Bassant. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I'm really happy to have you here. Uh, as you know, I've told everyone, you were the guy who basically made sure that Trinidad documentary I did happen without you would have been nothing. Still the biggest documentary I think I've ever done. But um, can you just introduce yourself to, to the listeners? You know, tell us who you are, where you're from, and what you do. Uh, first of all, Danny, thanks so much for having me. And, uh, you know, our friendship goes a long way back, uh, but at least I'd say about eight years. Um, I've been a journalist for over... 30 years, uh, roughly. I started off very young, at the age of 17, but I um, I went to Toronto where I did my BA in journalism major in broadcasting. Prior to that, I, I did a lot of crime reporting and so on. I uh, came back to Trinidad in 2006, um, where I covered crime extensively in Trinidad and Tobago. And in 2011, I delved into the the world of investigative journalism, which I've been doing for the last 12 of the 30 years. I'm a senior multimedia investigative journalist and producer at CCN, TV6 News, and the Trinidad Express. Um, so, uh, I, have, I've, I mean, uh, my experience uh, stretches across uh, the criminal landscape in terms of covering crime and investigating some, you know, uh, in-depth uh, pieces about the drug trade, about ISIS, and other things that hinge on that uh, human trafficking, which is uh, a, a, a seriously uh, um, and a concerning topic here in the Caribbean, and by extension, more or less Trinidad and Tobago, where have a number of Venezuelan uh, migrants have been coming over here over the last five years. A lot of women allude here um, uh, on the premise of uh, false premises of uh, jobs, and then they ended up end up in prostitution uh, through various human trafficking rings. Yeah, I definitely that was one of the topics I wanted to talk to you about, and how Venezuela and what's happening there is affecting everything in Trinidad. Definitely want to get to gangs of Trinidad, ISIS, and all that. But, you know, you're one of the few people I've worked with who I've gotten a WhatsApp message from that was like, hey, man, how's it going? I got to flee the country right now because I'm in danger. But everything's all good. You know, I think you were probably really calm when that happened. And you might have had to do that, I think, multiple times now, right? Can you tell people uh, about that and, and what happened there? Well, <laughs> uh, well, at least once. I mean, there, there, there's always threats as a journal, as investigative journalist, you know, um, doing you know, particular pieces. But in this particular instance, it was the first time I had to deal with it where I had to leave the country for the better part of about three months. Um, and when I did come back, I had um, bodyguards, 24-hour bodyguards for about six months. Uh, it, 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 incidentally, it was a piece that won me a regional investigative award uh, who, who killed Dina Sitahal, and uh, it was a very big story um, in 2014 when they shot and killed uh, Dina Sitahal, a state prosecutor on a way home in Woodbrook. Um, and uh, I, I kind of uh, got access to her phone, uh, to a relative who spoke to me exclusively, tracing her final steps, uh, getting an idea. And I, I think um, based on what I would have uh, written and, and broadcast on television, uh, I mean, there were some people that um, were allegedly involved. I have to say allegedly, they, are, they, ha they are, have been arrested and charged for the offense. Uh, for the, I've been sitting in jail for the better part of nine years, waiting um, trial. Um, so, 
But that happened, um, in, incidentally, and, and digging, uh, um, contacts in, in the jail told me about, you know, this whole thing about, um, you know, a hit being ordered uh, based on the fact that I had kind of zoned in on the alleged perpetrators. Um, so it was phone conversations that the authorities kind of uh, intercepted uh, with the help of uh, other intelligence uh, personnel I went to. And um, I think um, this person was very high up in uh, the defense force that recommended that I leave the country based on uh, the fact that not only the conversations were real, but the fact that um, there were people actually monitoring where I worked, uh, my movements over a two or three day period, I was told. And as a consequence of that, I had a meeting with uh, my CEO then and uh, uh, this high ranking intelligence uh, defense force officer who I'm still friends with and who was another high intelligence position to this day in, in Trinidad and Tobago and you know I owe him my life as well as other people who would have looked out for me and um uh it was anyway I mean as you said I I'm, I'm, I was cool but you know it was difficult uh, you know as an investigative journalist you know I was offered refugee in Canada and so on but you know um, you know, I, I stayed at that location where I was for about three months, came back to Trinidad briefly, and I went to Brazil for the World Cup at that time. Very low-key. Nobody knew I came and, and, and left. Uh, so when I came back to Trinidad, you know, I, 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 to, I told myself, you know, this is something that very few people would do and put their, their, their face out there when you're doing investigative journalism, especially on television. I mean, I, I do it on both mediums, but... Your, your, a print journalist, yes, will be known by name, but in most cases, you wouldn't see their face. So sometimes it might be a little bit more difficult to, to identify that person. But if you're very upfront and, and personal with people on television, um, you know, it's much easier to pinpoint uh, an investigative television journalist. Uh, and we've seen, um, sadly, you know, consequences of that in other countries where journalists in, in places like Mexico, for instance, uh, you know, they, a lot of them have been killed for investigating the drug cartels and so on. And then we had that, um, that very sad um, incident in Malta, invest in, in the female investigative journalist who mm -hmm. was killed allegedly by government officials uh, for unearthing uh, corruption and exposing some corrupt uh, government officials about three, 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 four years ago. And, Sadly, the case came, the people were held and, you know, uh, the matter was dismissed and these people were set free. Our son was very unhappy about that. Uh, I know in, in other cases, you know, we had one of the Russian, uh, the guy who owns the newspaper, forgive me, I forgot his name now, who won the, the uh, Pulitzer Prize recently with uh, the Filipino lady, who was also yeah. being threatened. So you know, it's 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 it comes with the territory, not just litigation and defamation and libel and slander, but you know there are people that would obviously want to try and silence you when you are doing or exposing corruption or or th that kind of criminal enterprise and all those things. Uh, luckily, um, you know, it has not been an issue thus far in the Caribbean, and I hope it will never become an issue. And I hope that we can purge ourselves about across the world but you know when you have criminal enterprises drug cartels you have you know multinational corporations etc uh you know when you expose these things you know you know as you said money talks you know and, and sometimes some people are easily bought by money uh, and you have that 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 also premise where they try to bribe journalists investigative journalists to uh stop writing about a particular subject matter i myself was approached many years ago and I, I actually sat before a parliamentary committee. Uh, you know, I was one of the first ones to ever be called by a parliamentary committee when I did a 16-part series about a corrupt uh, business transaction involving a, a boat that uh, the, the, the government was trying to bring to Trinidad. Incidentally, it was a boat that I understand, based on information provided to me over a period of time, was uh, being uh, was purchased by allegedly two government officials, so they would have been getting kickbacks and money from that. And I think um, after that long, uh, you know, over a three or four month period, they stopped the, the, the boat coming to Trinidad. Uh, it had a number of mechanical problems as well as the contract was squashed. So, you know, there's there's a lot of things, a lot of things that come with the territory of investigative journalists, not just the threat of, uh, you know, of death, but of litigation, of bribes and so on. And, and being able to hold truth to of, truth of form 
is important. Uh, you know, you're a bastion of, of the fourth estate and the people of, of your country and, and of the world. And they depend on you to obviously, um, you know, continue that good work and to continue unearthing and exposing, you know, corrupt individuals or corrupt businesses, as the case may be. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the things I picked up on you right away. You know, you're you're a version of a sort of old school journalist who really believes in what you're doing in the cause and put yourself at tremendous risk to, to do it. I want to say too, like you're, you know, you're old school in the way that you have people on the police force in the government and the military and gangsters, you know, criminals, and you break bread with all of them. How do you maintain those relationships? Um, you know, over the years, you know, trust is extremely important when you do this job. Uh, your credibility is also important and, and your word is important. So if you, once you establish that kind of relationship over a period of time, you know, with police officers say, hey, I don't want you to write this particular thing. Um, I'm just giving you it as a background, um, you know, or context. You have to be able to trust that, um, you know, that officer. And when you, when you write the story and they see that you have honored your, your word, not to include certain information, um, it builds that confidence and trust in you uh, or in them, sorry, um, that allows you, you know, to call them again, you know, and they'll sit here, you know, they, or they will willingly sometimes call you and share information. The same thing with the underworld. So you, yes, you, 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 um, you walk a very thin line, but you also have to be cognizant of the fact that you are in the middle you will get information from the police, you, you'll get information from the underworld and other sources, and you have to be able to balance that and quantify it, of course, because, you know, um, in, in our journalists, only as good as their sources, and it's important that you check with more than one source to verify a particular, um, you know, story or information for a particular story, as we all know. Um, you know, at least three, two, three, four sources even, is important so you know uh, at least you get a consensus that if two out of three tells you yes you know in most cases it, it's it's a credible um, the information is credible uh, or you have you know in our in our world of investigative journalism it's important to have a paper trail have documents um, apart from the word of mouth and all these things to also in terms of protect yourself uh, legally and, and give the, the person or persons or business corporations or whoever it might be um, that chance to answer the allegations, uh, you know, raised in a particular document, raised by a particular person, raised by a particular other business corporation or, or, or any other kind of interest. What's the situation like right now in Trinidad in terms of, you know, the guns and the, the violence, the gangs, you know, we had done that documentary and then I actually done an episode of the podcast that was kind of based on old information. We talked about, uh, you know, Rasta city versus the Muslims and all that. But now it seems like it's really fractured into these smaller gangs. The violence I've seen last year, or this year is already through the roof, just as bad as it was, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago when I was down there, what's happening right now on the streets in Trinidad? Uh, good question, Danny. And the thing is, um, there, ha there has been an increase in gangs and gang activity. So you have like, you know, you have six, you have seven, you have, you have, you have a number of gangs now that are splintered, as you have indicated, from Rasta and Muslim, you know. And um, it's quite worrying because you have that, you have, you know, you also have, I have to include the element of Trini bad music, right? Uh, it's like a Jamaican dance hall that Trinidadians now, uh, artists have began to sing. You know, and they promote a lot of the, uh, you know, the violence, but they have particular gangs that they sing for in terms of, and you will see the gang signs sometimes in their, their music and so on. But not to digress, um, but the gun violence has exploded exponentially over the last three to five years. And we've seen, you know, a, a, you know, a colossal rise in the, in the homicide rate in Trinidad and Tobago. In a population of 1.4 million, just recently, per capita, Trinidad was ranked about fifth in the world for homicide rates, right? Behind Honduras and a couple other countries, if memory serves me right. And that is very worrying. And we've seen now, 
rather than previously you had a lot of the, the used firearms and guns coming from the South American mainland of Venezuela, you're seeing now, and I have seen a report um, last year um, by the former police commissioner. I was able, I was see bits and pieces of the report, extracts of it, um, where incidentally, the three top <coughs> locations that guns are coming from is from within the United States of America. Mm -hmm. um, we have places like um, uh, New York, the Baltimore, Georgia, and uh, oh, I think Florida, right? If memory serves me right. Well, maybe not New York. Maybe they're coming from there in origin, but definitely not getting them in New York. It's a lot harder to get guns in New York. Florida for sure. Texas, Georgia, those yes. are, those sound there very familiar. Of, there are a lot of um, you know linkages made by people here, and uh, incidentally, I've written quite extensively over the last year and a half about uh, heavy weaponry and firearms coming in and being found in, in the bonds uh, by customs and police officers in a particular bond in Central Trinidad and sometimes in a bond up in the airport, Piaco International Airport. Um, uh, the heavy firearm, I know, you know, you have AK-47s, you have, you know, brand new firearms, you know, you have uh, hand grenades, you have, uh, you know, ammunition and so on. And when you, you look at the explosion of gun violence that have uh, and spill, you know, onto the streets now, um, you see a lot of heavy weaponry being used in, in, in a lot of the homicides, right? Uh, you know, and armor piercing bullets, etc. Um, and I don't want to to make it seem that Trinidad is is um, is not safe everywhere. There are particular places, and you would know anywhere you will let you go. It's rather, you know, you know, you know, just choose not to venture there unless you know somebody who, or somebody who's familiar with the territory. But there are people who, um, you know, are involved in gang activities. And sometimes, I'm not saying all the time it happens, but sometimes this particular person might be out of a zone where they're not supposed to be, and they're shot and killed. In some instances, when gunmen, gunmen come for, for a particular individual, and that individual is in, in, in public, they're just in public, and they open fire, they might actually hit other persons innocently who might be killed, right? Um, and I know gun violence is nothing new to the United States or to other countries because you know, there's, you know, there was recently an incident in, I think it's Philadelphia a couple years ago, Danny. Mm -hmm. Right, so, um, incidentally, uh, the CARICOM leaders, um, a couple, they had a meeting in Bahamas with um, the Vice President, Kamala Harris, uh, about three weeks ago, they talked about, you know, this scourge of guns coming in for the United States. Some of the leaders were critical about the U.S. not assisting. And she gave a pledge to actually get the U.S. Um, involved. Um, so the CARICOM actually set up a criminal gun intelligence unit. So they can track, you know, how these firearms are coming into the country, you know, look at the major players who are actually... Uh, bringing in these firearms into the various Caribbean countries, etc. And, um, you know, it's just incidentally, uh, you know, Blinken, U.S. Secretary, came into Trinidad uh, yesterday, and he had a speech he made yesterday afternoon to all the CARICOM leaders pledging the United States assistance um, in helping to get rid uh, or, or put a stranglehold on this gun trade that is, um, you know, coming, a lot of the guns coming from the United States into Trinidad. And he, he indicated that they had appointed a special prosecutor by the name of Michael Benary to serve as the United States first coordinator for the Caribbean firearms prosecution. So we have an affirmation by the United States to assist these Caribbean countries in putting a, uh, you know, tightening a, a grip on this, um, you know, this country. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a thing too. It's not just uh, Trinidad, right? We have those kind of guns flowing from the U.S. into Mexico, uh, Haiti, right? Wasn't that a big story recently with the gangs there and 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 the the coup and all that? And then Jamaica, it's been for decades. You know, uh, Jamaican gangs having guns smuggled into Jamaica from the U.S. I mean, that goes back to. I feel like the late seventies, early eighties. It's been a it's been a tremendous thing. This sort of 
uh, trafficking of guns out of the U.S. into countries like Trinidad and the damage that the fallout that happens because of it. Correct. And, uh, and it's, it's, um, I mean, uh, uh, thankfully, we're not as bad as Haiti or anywhere near that where gangs have actually taken over parts of Port-au-Prince, mm-hmm. or Port-au-Prince, some people say, um, that, you know, they are actually, they are, they are, they are hold up, held up in, in government buildings and they, they have, have a stranglehold. And, and Blinking actually said that they are also giving the commitment to the Haitian president to actually help Haiti in that context as well yesterday. So I'm sure the Haitian president would have been um, pretty happy about that. Um, and, and that is a very, 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 very sad situation in Haiti now. Um, you know, even journalists uh, are not safe there. Foreign journalists even are not safe there. I remember there was a journalist that was actually kidnapped and was recently a couple months ago. Right. The Luckily, she huge. got out and they, they, they released her. You know, but the atrocities of these gangs killing innocent uh, men and raping their wives and their daughters and so on. Uh, and they, they seem not to be, um, you know, they don't account to anybody and they, they're not willing to even relent or, or meet and discuss any kind of things with the government of the day. In, in terms of the gangs in Trinidad right now, you know, we talked about the Rastas and the Muslims. Uh, are they still in power? Have they fractured at all? Are there smaller gangs that you know of that are kind of rising up? Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. It, it seems that, um, you know, a lot, a lot of those other gangs have kind of, um, you know, uh, those gangs obviously still there, but I think there's, um, you know, some of the younger ones are gravitated to, to other gangs, you know, gangs that I guess as I told you, you know, they have the six, seven, they have a number of gangs that have sprung up over the last three, four years. Um, where the dominance of 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 of, of um, the Rasta and the Muslim city is not it's it's spread out a little more now so than from than before. Um so you have a different type of psyche associated with some of these other gangs where before you had a particular order, you had certain elders of these gangs or, or as they say, community leaders. And many years ago, they all met and tried to, to think up a peace treaty. Now, it's rather different. There's, there's very little logic, um, you know, by, by some of these gangs and their, their leaders, and they continue this and fighting, and they're, they're very bold-faced in how they... they, um, they they, they perpetuate their crimes, you know. They, there's there's very little regard for life and even for people walking on the streets, you know. And, and it's sadly, sometimes people are caught in the crossfire, as I told you, you know, in areas, um, in public areas even. So um, yeah. it's not frequent, but it's concerning enough where you, you see that. And then, you know, we've looked at the impact of cartels in Venezuela, and how they've used and other sort of international drug trafficking groups and, and narcs, I'm sorry, uh, narcotic trafficking groups have uh, have used Trinidad as a way station and sort of you know brought cocaine over from Venezuela, large amounts to be sent to the U.S. or to Europe. Is that still an issue on the islands? Well, Trinidad has always been one of those major transshipment points that you know drug traffickers have been using. And it has also been a gateway now for other contraband to come through there. So you don't just have drugs and guns, but you also have, which has morphed incidentally over the last five to seven years, human trafficking. That has become a a, a seriously big business where you have criminals, you have law enforcement, uh, personnel attached to these Venezuelan gangs uh, um, that, that, that help to fuel the trade. And it's big business here where you have five, 10, 15 women in locked away in a, in a, in a, in a house. Yes, their passports are seized. In one in, I'm just taking in one instance, they made to go to a brothel and work and have sexual relations with up to 30 men a night sometimes, um, you know, depending. Um, and that has been a thorn in the side of a, the Trinidad Tobago law enforcement authorities 
where we have not been able, we barely made it back to tier two um, in the last U.S. Um, report about three months ago, uh, where they dealt with human trafficking. You know, tier one is the highest, and I think tier four is the lowest, or so three. So we're kind of like in midway still, but we were just tethering on that two. We almost dropped to three. I was having a conversation with a former head of the counter trafficking unit. We expressed a lot of concern because, um, you know, it's like when you cut, you know, one, the, 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 the head off of one of the hydras, six more uh, pops up. And, um, it becomes something very lucrative where a lot of a lot of young people uh, and their networks are getting involved in this, opening bars and under the pretense of bars, and then they're running brothels and prostitution and exploiting these young women who come here in search of a better life because of the situation in Venezuela, um, which has been you know over the last couple of years bad. Uh, you know we had a we had a. A lot of them that came here to Trinidad and Tobago illegally and were given status to work and reside here for a period of time. Um, and you know, they kept renewing that over a period of time. Recently, they renewed it for another year where they're allowed to work here and also get free medical care as a case may be. The only problem is that you know they're not allowed to actually access the educational system in Trinidad and Tobago for their children. So they actually have to pay for private lessons if they want their children to learn and, and, and you know to read and write, etc. But so it's a it's a whole you know a, that societal problem and, and then you have all these other criminal um, elements involved. So it, it's as I said, it's a it's a very worrying um, you know trend and it continues to morph. Regardless of how much they've been trying over the last, and I've covered a number of stories about human trafficking. I have done extensively work in the Caribbean, um, and Trinidad seems to be one of one of those countries where human trafficking in the Caribbean is huge, comparatively to the other countries, uh, which are of a lesser extent, right? Um, but certainly, it is something that we need to address because you have there's this pottery of of criminal, uh, you know, ingredients being mixed in, not just the, the, the guns and the drug trade, but now you have the human traffic injury. Um, and I think um, it's it's considered one of the biggest trades, illicit trades in the world, um, if memory serves me right. Um, it was like, I think it was at the top of the list recently, you know, because we also have those networks in Europe and other areas in Asia and Africa and so on. Um, that is quite extensive. So there's certainly a problem that the authorities need to address, but to do such, you also have to stamp out those uh, corrupt law enforcement officers that that range from Coast Guard officers to the immigration officers to the police officers to immigration officers, if I didn't say it before. So there, it is certainly something that needs that kind of um, attention so that um, we can be in a better place hopefully in the next two years or three years um, and treat these people with the respect that they deserve, these women, these young men who are trying to get a better life, not only for themselves, but they leave children back in Venezuela and their parents, so they have to send money for them. And, and in some cases, or in most cases, a lot of them don't know what their daughters or their wives or their sisters have been subjected to here in Trinidad and Tobago until sometimes it comes out in the media uh, or they go back to Venezuela after a period of time and they relate their story to you know the Venezuelan media or other personnel. Yeah, for those that don't know, Trinidad is is very close to to the border or, or to Venezuela. It's a short boat ride away. So as things have gotten a lot tougher in Venezuela, as the economy there has continued to collapse, especially over the last ten years or so, uh, you know, a lot of people have fled Venezuela, and a lot of them have gone to to Trinidad. And Mark, you know, are the are the people who are doing the the human trafficking there? Are the people who are running these brothels? Are they Venezuelan gangs? Are they Venezuelan group like gangs or criminal organizations that have formed alliances with Trinidadian gangs? Uh, and even besides, you know, human trafficking, is there a presence now of Venezuelan criminal groups on uh, in Trinidad and Tobago? 
Oh, the good question, Dan. And the, the answer to the all of the above is yes, uh, but not with the, ex, but with the extensiveness. A lot of the Venezuelan gangs have their ties in Venezuela, so they're not, well, I'm saying, or oh, oh, the trafficking ties are there and they, they're there. So what they do is that they would get the criminal elements here in Trinidad involved and they have, to be honest, there's also, uh, I wrote um, a couple of years ago about, you know, the Chinese mafia also having that kind of a relationship where they have a lot of young women, they traffic internally in their organization. And quite incidentally, as you talk about that, I remember meeting somebody that I know um, who is allegedly in the, he's in the underworld. He has been in and out of jail and he told me that when I wrote that piece, one of the, the guys called him and wanted to kind of uh, silence me for about 25,000 US and he told him he could oh. do it. I'm just telling you that I only learned that about uh, within the last year. I was shocked. I wrote those pieces in 2021. But you have that you have a lot of businessmen in Trinidad and Tobago who obviously, um, you know, they get that link and they, they become involved. And, you know, as I say, um, when you have that link and you have those linkages, you have people here now transporting new women from, from the rendezvous points in Citrus or even Shagaramas even, um, or Erin, which is in deep south. For those that don't know, uh, Arian, Cedras, and these are deep south. And it's merely, a, as you said, a boat ride from Venezuela. Um, it's a, the closest point between Trinidad and Venezuela is about seven to eight miles, which is about, you know, pretty much where you can actually and a clear day see Venezuela from, from the, the southwestern peninsula of Trinidad and Tobago in Sydney areas. Um, so you have those business, there's those businessmen who are front legitimate businesses bringing in these women and having them there and locked in or under the guise of working at the bar sometimes they work at bars because that's a lot of the jobs that they do but then they also illicit sex uh, by and then they have landlords that actually i remember during covid a lot of them had actually instead of taking people weren't able to pay their rent these young venezuelan women they asked for sex in exchange it's only recently uh Somebody had uh, a young Venezuelan woman came out and talked about that uh, on social media. So, you know, there's a lot of exploitation outside of human trafficking, but some of them who are working at, or trying to make an honest living is also exploited by those that they live by or, or work for legitimately. And then in terms of the drug dealing in there, is that a thing where, you know, is it Venezuelan groups that are bringing it through the island? Or is it other groups that are using Venezuela as a base, maybe getting it from Venezuela, getting it in Trinidad, and then bringing it to Europe or the U.S.? Well, um, the, 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 the drug trade has really evolved over the last few years. So, you, know, have a, you, know, you have a number of new players. So as I said, you, know, you have your Venezuela links. They have their people here in Trinidad. They have law enforcement. Then they have people here who have links in Venezuela, who also get their people to bring it across here. There are people that they have working um, in, in, in the, the shipping agencies, um, um, sometimes in the airports as well. So they coordinate with these people who they pay to get the drugs out of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, sometimes up to Europe or to North America, uh, as the case may be. And the networks have obviously grown over the last few years and, and drug traffickers uh, and the networks have gotten even smarter in how they conceal, um, you know, cocaine or marijuana. You know, in some cases, I remember, um, not just putting it in food, but in actually in electronic items and where, uh, or, or, you know, the padding tires, car tires, and so on. So they, they, they become very innovative in how they hide the contraband and to try to get it out of, of, um, of, the, of Trinidad and Tobago to Europe to North America. You know, you're mentioning these these other groups and the sort of multifaceted way that drugs move through the island. In the documentary we did, I think that was back in 2014, we talked about the big fish in Trinidad, the sort of people in the big houses up on the hills who orchestrate the drug trade but aren't involved in the violence on the ground level, have government connections and kind of get away with it because of that. You know, the one the people who wear the suits. Is that still an issue? Has there been any progress made in sort of cracking that that level of, of corruption, that level of 
you know, uh, businessmen who's actively involved in the drug trade? The answer to that question, short answer to it is no, it hasn't changed. Um, uh, as I said, I, as I said before, you know, in a country like Trinidad and Tobago, and I, I guess a lot of other countries across the world, money talks, right? Yeah. Um, so you have that ghost hand of these uh, businessmen who, as I say, some of them have legitimate interests, but they also conduct clandestine activities behind that, behind that legitimate, um, you know, front, so to speak. So it has been something perennial. As I said, knowing and proving is two different things. You would know certain things, you're told certain things by certain people, but being able to prove it is another another issue. I, I remember when the former commissioner was in, in power, um, Mr. Gary Griffith, somebody had told me there was actually somebody I, I trust very much in the intelligence organization, uh, authorities, and said that there was a particular boat that was allowed to pass that belonged to a major businessman down the islands, and they offloaded um, you know, a shipment of cocaine at a house, a house there, a beach house down the islands. Um, and the person seemed, to, the, the information seemed to kind of been very solid based on what he told me, and he gave me some more insight. But that person obviously is untouchable because of. The, the, the money that they have and the connections that they have. It's all about who you know here in Trinidad and Tobago. It's all about who you know. Um, you know, and I've, I've said that to Anthony Bourdain, God rest his soul in peace, when he came to Trinidad a couple of years after you did to invest, to, to talk about Trinidad and not just about, about crime, but other elements. And, you know, one of the first things he asked me is, he said to me was, so they wanted to kill you. Why? Um, and, you know, I think trying to expose people who do wrong, obviously, and then you also have that element of the ISIS thing that I, I would have broken uh, many years ago uh, where, you know, Trinidadians were seen going across or trying to get to Syria in many instances. When, it was, when ISIS was ISIS back in, in 2013, 14, 15, there were about 16. Um, so, as you said, Danny, it's a perennial problem. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a circle that continues to spin, where you have some of the people at the top, untouchable, that people know that they're involved, but there's no empirical evidence to suggest that. I mean, like, at least, and then you have these officers or, or, or law enforcement who are beholden to these people, so or they appear to look the other way. So the, all those things you, you have to think about and take into consideration when, as I said, you might know a particular person is heavily involved in a particular uh, illicit activity, but nobody's willing to go on your record or nobody's willing to, to make the, the move to arrest the person because the person is connected. They pay a lot of money to somebody to not touch them, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, you mentioned the the ISIS thing, which is, I mean, I thought it was a huge story. I remember when you told me about it, this is like 2014, I think maybe. And, uh, you know, I had been doing reporting in, in Syria and Iraq and you were like, all these Trinidadians are going to join ISIS. I think they're taking a boat somewhere, they're gonna go. And I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, Mark, what, whatever. Like this sounds far-fetched. And it ended up being really true. And there were all these stories in the years to come that about how I think Trinidad out of any country in the, uh, in the Western hemisphere had the most people proportionately going to join ISIS. And you know, you, you're the one who broke that story wide open. So can you talk a little bit about that and how that came to be? Yeah. So, um, basically I got a call from a source in, in Venezuela that there were over 80 Trinidadians at a hotel there for over three months. Now, incidentally, this was the early phases of ISIS when ISIS was now becoming ISIL, right? And um, and I, I understand that there was a raid at the hotel and they arrested all 80 something odd Trinidadians. But what we later found out was that there were a number of them that were there, that were held, that was held, sorry, children and women and, and men that were actually going to the Hajj, right? So there were people within that 
that group that tried to use the, the visit of the Hajj or mask their true intent of going to Syria by mixing with these Muslims, these other Muslims, sorry. And um, they had already they arrested the, 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 all the Trinidadians and after a period of time, um, they would have relieved the children and the men and so on. Some, sorry, women and children. Uh, and they, held, and they kept about, I guess, about 10, 12 of them. I remember doing a number of, where I actually got intelligence documents showing that some of these men had gone to, they had been training with uh, a secret, the Venezuelan has a, a police force called Seven. It's like a secret intelligence uh, police service. And these men were on the firing range learning to shoot firearms. Why? Question marks arose. Um, there was about five or six Trinidadian men. You could see their faces and so on. So I did a piece about that. Uh, Jihadists Among Us or something. That was my first piece. And then I had a follow-up I did about ISIS fighters. Where there was a pattern of a lot of people masking their travel through, um, you know, going to Tobago and then taking a flight from Tobago to Europe. Uh, going, actually some of them took boats from uh, southwestern peninsula of Trinidad, getting into Venezuela. Then traveling from Venezuela, taking a plane from Venezuela into Brazil. Then from Brazil, they would go to Europe, and from Europe, they go into Turkey and then cross into the into Syria, right? So you know, people have started, gradually started to come out, family members of people who were there for months, some people who understand that their, their sons or their fathers or their brothers had died, you know, over a period of time, and it was being kept hush-hush for quite a while. Um, you know, so over a period of time, uh, I think over a two-year period, 2014 into 2015, even 2016, I think 2013 too. If memory serves me right, it would have been before 2014. Um, so, you, you, as you quite rightly pointed out, uh, back in the U.S. Senate committee hearing, I think was about two years ago, uh, a colonel there spoke about uh, the, the per capita Trinidad in the Caribbean had the highest among there were like over 120, 130 Trinidadians that had gone to Syria over a period of time. And I think the U.S. had expressed some concern because some of these men, not all, some did come back to Trinidad quite covertly, of course, because some would usually, if they flew out and they went to Europe, I know for a fact that they couldn't come back when they were found out that they were actually in Syria. They couldn't come back through the normal channels. So some would actually have flown to Venezuela and then take boats and got in back into Trinidad covertly. Um, some, when they were found out, they were they they were being monitored when they were when they were when those that were served time in the Venezuelan jail were brought back to Trinidad. They were being monitored, etc. To see you know, and then you also have those that were in Syria, you know, become very radicalized. In their thinking, um, you know, some were also lived through the internet, as we know, across the world. That was also um, an issue in America and the United Kingdom, etc. So you had that element when it was quite fresh, and a lot of the, the, the Trinidadian, the Black Trinidadian men, some of them uh, inculcated, uh, you know, adopted uh, Islam as their religion, right? For and, and other Imams would say uh, for the wrong reason. They claimed that they were being persecuted in Trinidad and Tobago. You had people like Shane Crawford and John Algernon, both who died in Syria. They were like the post, the post, the postcard boys uh -huh. um, in the earlys, and they were involved in a lot of criminal activity in Trinidad and Tobago. And incidentally, when they left Trinidad, they were actually involved in a murder where they shot and killed a man. And one of the guys that was driving the car, um, the he was all. He also went to Syria after he died. His, his family is very rich, and um, I, I forgot his name now. But Shane Crawford and this this John Algernon were very tight, very close friends, and they shot and killed a man. And this guy was driving the car, and they had like somebody who was on the police service, and they called him in his police force and said, "Hey, there's going to be a roadblock a mile up the road." So so they they abandoned the car, but they left the guy. They, they jumped out, and he continued onward. They arrested the guy because they found a bullet casing in the car. Of course, he was. He, they couldn't really pinpoint anything else apart from that. 
But say, man, I, I think he came out on bail for he was charged for possession of ammunition, I believe, or something like that. And then he later left. He fled the country and he went to Syria. And his family never spoke to me on the record, but I understand that he would have called them a few times on Skype. I was I was privy to screen grabs and some people who had sent it to me. Um, they were very, um, I guess, they were very hurt and disappointed that he probably ch chose that path. So you know, you had that element of secrecy for quite a while until you know within the second year, a lot of people came out, families and relatives of those who went and or they they married and they they, they took their wives or they took women with their children under the pretext of you know we're going for a better life, not knowing that. In some cases, some of them really told the media later that they never knew that their husband or, or their, 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 the person that they had just recently married um, was going to fight for ISIS. So, you know, there was, there was quite, you know, a number of elements to this story um, from the beginning to the end. It was quite an interesting time, um, though dangerous, you know, a lot of, you know, concern about terror, terrorism and terror-related activities, and the fact that when these people become radicalized and they, some of them make their way back to the Caribbean, it's easy for them to actually, in some cases, get to the U.S., and I think that's where the concern arose as well. Yeah, I mean, it was a wild time. Uh, I do remember the fear of, of some of these people coming back to Trinidad and the concerns that Trinidad maybe uh, it was border control, whatever it was, wasn't secure enough to handle that sort of infiltration. But so far, it looks like things have uh, have been okay. Um, you know, I want to wrap up with you soon, but uh, what, are you, what are you up to these days and where can people find you? Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm back at CCN TV, Six News and the Express, uh, doing um, what I do best you know, in terms of investigative uh, multimedia platforms. Um, so I am on Instagram, Mark Dunbassand1. I'm also on Twitter. Barely use it though. I'm on Facebook. And um, I can also be reached by Mark Dunbassand at ccngroup.com. If you have a story that, as I said, that might be worth investigating, not just in Trinidad, but has links in the US, and feel free to hit me up, you know, and you can also reach me at Mark Dunbassand at gmail.com. That's Bassand with two S's, B A S S. A N T. Um, I'm actually working on a piece that will take me about the next three weeks to put together involving um, a scam at a particular ministry that has been going on for the last four years, which has been bleeding taxpayers the better part of, I'd say, 10 million US dollars. So I'm actually finishing with my, my other source. I've been going through a lot of data over the last three days and reports to kind of piece together everything so that my source can help me make sense of it now that he sent it to me to go over. And as you know, I do everything myself, literally. Some people would see yeah. uh, I did a documentary, a uh, 46-minute documentary a couple of years ago. I, you know, I entered it in uh, one of the highest sporting awards um, in, the, in the world, AIPA. I had to deal with a Trinidadian former football president, John Williams, where he, a lot of the money was being, um, there, there was no, no one was accounting for the money that FIFA gave to the Trinidadian Tobago Football Federation under his tenure for quite a while. And over, uh, I think, a four-year period, I was able to get information that he was a contractor that apparently had basically contracted himself to do the job and he went to Panama and he met a guy who bought the material. And there were bank accounts that I was able to access through the help of uh, some people where we found a bank account. He had money in Panama and was putting um, allegedly money that um, he got from FIFA and he was enriching himself, so to speak. Uh, he, has, he has now passed, but rest this will in peace. Uh, I did that piece in 2021, I believe. Um, so I'm not that versed. I, I, I've done cross-border uh, investigations in Jamaica. I've gone to Canada, the U.S., um, uh, where else? Uh, Venezuela, Guyana, and so on. So there are times when the story would take you out of the country as well. And, and, and I always encourage cross-border collaboration because sometimes you might get information that is relevant and pertinent to a story both of us are working on and I can also help you on my side 
So, you know, anybody who knows of any stories that are worth investigating and has links to Trinidad, you know, there are a lot of stories. Um, I've, I've kind of uh, have a little partnership with the OCCRP, the Organized Crime Reporting Crime Corruption Project. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm linked with some reporters there from um, from Greece and South Africa. I also was just recently contacted by Al Jazeera, one of the head guys there from England, came to Trinidad to see me. Um, and they're quite interested in this region and doing some some investigative uh, you know stuff. And as I said, this is also a haven where a lot of a lot of businessmen and a lot of people who try to hide their money go to the Cayman Islands, Turks and Caicos, other offshore accounts. So the, the, the only problem here in the Caribbean is that our access to data and information sometimes is problematic. Whereas in the bigger international uh, investigative entities, they are able to access information that I might not be able to. So I, I kind of piggyback off them and they piggyback off me in, in some cases to assist one another. And that's what cross-border investigation and collaboration is about. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Mark. I really appreciate it and for helping me back uh, all those years at the documentary and everything else and uh, looking forward to seeing what else you do, man. I appreciate it, Danny. And uh, I know hopefully I'll be in New York soon so we can go hang out. You know, I mean, um, it would be nice. Yeah, like last time, man. We'll hang. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, COVID had kept me, uh, like, the last time I was in New York was uh, late 2019. I went to Yeah, it's been a couple of years. Yeah.